Recently, I have watched this tutorial from the YouTuber Max Jitterbug, which is about fluid simulation in Max, and I liked it a lot. I have been interested in fluid simulation since a lot of years, but never really tried to learn it properly or code it by myself, mostly because it's a super complex topic. At least for me, it is. So, the tutorial from Max Jitterbug does a great job in creating a working 2D fluid simulation, but some of the concepts are not explained in depth, which is totally fine, this is not the goal of uh, this video. So, what I would like to do now is start a new series of video where we are going to do exactly that. We are going to take all the elements that uh, compose a fluid simulation, a 2D one, and we are going to explain them one by one in order to have them all as clear as possible in our heads. I want to thank again Max Jitterbug for creating that Ozone tutorial, which kick-started my interest for this topic once again. Fluid simulation is about recreating as nicely as possible the behavior of fluids in our computer. Fluids, uh, for example, can be water or smoke. Air is also a fluid, since all the gases are basically considered fluids. There are several techniques used to simulate fluids, and we're going to use one called smoothed particle hydrodynamics, which basically represents the fluids as a collection of particles. This series of tutorials will be loosely based on this paper, which you can find linked under the video from the Max Jitterbug channel and also under this video. The paper is pretty complex, uh, as I said for me at least, but with the help of Khan Academy for the math and ChatGPT, I'm sure we will be able to go a long way. This first video is about uh, understanding what is the gradient of a scalar field, which is a pretty essential concept to grasp if you want to do fluid simulation. So, since the gradient doesn't work without the scalar field, let's define what the scalar field is. We can imagine it as a 2D grid field with numbers. Each number represents the output of a function that takes as input n variables, where n is the dimensions of our grid. In this case it's 2 because we are in 2D. So the function will take as input the x and y coordinates of each cell on the grid, and for each cell it will give an output based on those coordinates. Examples of scalar fields are temperature and pressure. Let's take for example this grid, which has 20 by 20 cells. Each cell of this grid is filled with the output of a function that calculates the distance of each cell from the center of the grid, considering that the coordinates of the cell are represented as signed and normalized, like the output of the S-norm object in JITGEN. So the numbers that you're seeing represent the distance of each cell from the center of this grid. As we can see, the maximum distance will be 1.41, when both the x and the y values of the coordinates are at their maximum value, which is 1 or minus 1. We can also see the output of the function represented as brightness of color. The brightest color will be the maximum value, although OpenGL will clamp the colors to the value of 1, so it will just be white. We can rescale the range of the wall matrix by dividing it by 1.41, so that we can have a better understanding of where is the maximum distance. As you can see, the only white cells now are the ones that have the maximum distance of 1.41. So, this is a scalar field. The gradient of a scalar field is then a vector field. This means that each cell of the matrix or grid contains now a vector with a direction and a magnitude. But what do these vectors represent? And this is pretty mind-blowing, but this represents the direction in which the scalar field is increasing. So let's imagine our scalar field in 3D, or better, let's actually visualize it. The values that we saw before in the grid are now used as the y values for the vertices of this pyramid-shaped 3D shape. As you can see, the highest point in this pyramid are where we had the number 1.4 in the grid, so at the corners. So the vectors, these arrows, are pointing the direction in which the shape grows on the y-axis. If the shape will point down, the vector will go in the other direction. Let's now see a couple more functions. This one, for example, which gives us output the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared. As you can see, the magnitude of these vectors, so the length, increases when the slope of the shape is steeper. So we don't only have information about the direction of the steepest increases in the scalar field, but also we know how steep are the increments. If the arrow will show only the arrow head, like in the center, it means that the adjacent numbers in the field are the same or very similar. In 3D will mean we have a flat portion of the shape. 
Let's take a look at this color field generated with JIT PFG. As you can see, it changes with time, so the vectors will orient themselves to point in the direction of the steepest increases in the scalar field. And now let's get to the part where we actually calculate a gradient for a scalar field. Let's do some patching. Let's use JIT BFG as our scalar field. We output a matrix with only one plane, since a scalar field is a field of scalars, which means a single number and not a vector. Let's then create a JIT gen and use this matrix as the input. We need two planes as an output though, since a gradient is a vector field and for vectors we need at least two components. Since we are working in 2D, we will have 2D vectors as output, so two planes are enough. We can add another plane by passing the JITBFG matrix into another matrix with same dimensions and type, but two planes. Inside the JIT gen, we need to sample the input matrix four times. This is because to calculate a gradient, we need to calculate the partial derivative of each point in the scalar field. Partial derivative sounds scary, but actually is a pretty simple concept. We can calculate the partial derivatives of the function that produces the output, in this case the GPFG object, checking the difference between the left cell and the right cell for the x-axis and from the upper cell and the cell below for the y-axis, and we do this for each cell. To check the difference, we simply subtract the left cell from the right one and then divide by 2. This will be the x-component of the vector for this cell and this will be the y component. It's called partial derivative because we calculate first the derivative, thinking that y stays constant, and then we do the same thinking that x stays constant. What we used here are not analytical derivatives, which is what you will find in a math exercise. Instead, we use something called numerical differentiation, which allows us to use the discrete data points and quantized increments of one cell to get the rate of change of our 2D input matrix. And that's it! The output matrix will contain the vector field which represents the gradient of the input scalar field. I will now plug this matrix into this abstraction I've created to visualize a vector field. The abstraction is inspired by the one you will find in the Max Jitterbug video, but I used a personal recipe which doesn't involve shaders and will graphically fix the vectors at the center of the cells. Seems to be working alright! So this was it for the first video. In the next one, we are probably going to see what divergence, another fundamental topic of fluid simulation, is. You can find the patches I've used for the explanations in this video on my Patreon. The link will be in the description, as well as with all the other links that we talked about earlier. Thank you very much for following, I hope this was somehow useful, and I will see you in the next video. Ciao!